Back in February, the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration announced its intent to enable vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle or V2V -V communication technology for light vehicles. Not only does V2V -V technology have the potential to improve the safety of road travel, but it also has the potential to reduce environmental impacts and slash travel time. To help provide us with some insight on this topic, we talked to several experts at IMS 2014 in Tampa Bay, Florida, involved with test and measurement, power solutions, research and development, IC components, and module solutions. The experts included Matt Maxwell, Product Manager at Tektronix Spectrum Analyzers, Mihul Udani, General Manager responsible for connectivity solutions for Murata Americas, Edgardo Menendez, Field Applications Engineer at AVX Corporation, Eric Lynn, National Sales Manager OEM at Varda Micro Battery, and Reginald Vare, Research Associate with the Connected and Advanced Vehicle Systems Group at Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. To get the conversation started, I asked each panelist to explain what V2V -V communication meant to them specifically, especially within the fields they were involved in. It's having the ability for vehicles to have a wireless link both to each other and to the infrastructure for uh, different safety applications as well as um, maybe other applications. So Mirada is a global leader in enabling wireless communications and automotive for several years. And we've been shipping Bluetooth and GPS and Wi-Fi most recently. And AVX is a, is a worldwide um, supplier of RF micro components to several different markets including automotive and this is just a new opportunity and a new challenge to get more RF components into the automotive uh, applications. Yeah, and, and Varda Micro Battery, what we do is we do a lot of uh, custom battery solutions for uh, a variety of applications, including automotive. What this enables us to do is it's just the next generation of technology as we've looked at some of the e-call systems historically that have been introduced in the last 10 or 15 years. This is just the next generation and allows us, gives us another application where we can put uh, power solutions in. VTTI since 2006 um, has basically expanded significantly in the connected vehicle space, conducting more than 30 million uh, in research projects uh, focused on connected vehicles. Um, in particular, uh, the group that I represent at VTTI, yes. the Connected uh, and Advanced Vehicle Systems yes. Group, we focus on the design, development, and evaluation of connected vehicle systems with a focus on overall system performance. Um, in this particular role, our group, uh, we work closely with uh, both industry uh, and government partners such as the DOT, NHTSA, um, and basically providing results and recommendations based off our research on these uh, particular type of technologies. We continued on with questions concerning the challenges of V2V, the protocols and standards that need to be considered, and the main catalyst needed to help mass integrate connected car technology. Here's what the panelists had to say. Uh, in terms of tests, so I'm from Tektronix, for mm -hmm. test equipment to, to integrate the wireless systems into the car, it, it, there's, there's some challenges there. You have to have test equipment that has enough performance, that has enough margin to perform the different measurements that are needed, um, and, and you have to make sure you can get the systems to work correctly. You can make sure there's minimal interference between the wireless devices in your car and wireless devices that people may bring in mm -hmm. or out in, in the world. And then um, trying to troubleshoot problems when things don't work correctly, because now there's quite a bit of software to control the entire system. I need to have to make sure everything kind of works correctly with the other systems that are involved. 11P is a uh, short range uh, solution uh, and it requires, our customers need to solve RF issues and that's where Murata comes in is we build a complete solution with a module uh, so that uh, it helps them to solve their problems but there, there are a lot, lot of issues around system related mm -hmm. so our module uh, having to talk to antenna and as you can imagine, cars are crossing each other in a split second, and you need to report it. Um, so antenna, antenna placement, uh, and resolving all those communication issues is where we come in and working with our customers to solve those issues. From a passive components point of view, um, um, the, these modules are going to require a lot of different types of RF capacitors and inductors and diplexers, mm -hmm. and uh, all these components are going to be required to be able to uh, withstand um, automotive environments mm -hmm. that change a lot in temperature. So with our new MLO technology, we believe that uh, we can um, definitely pass a lot of, the, a lot of these uh, ACQ200 type tests that are required by the automotive uh, industry um, and 
uh, so, to solve a lot of the RF issues. Uh. So yeah, so when, when you look at from a power and energy standpoint, uh, you know, in these systems, a lot of times in the vehicle, the vehicle things, you're going to get power from the vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. uh, however, when you begin to look at aftermarket issues, you're going to might have a separate battery requirement uh, in order to power these devices. So when you begin to design those things, and you have to be careful, you know, in terms of some of the electronics that you put in with a battery for charging, so that there's not interference with some of the RF components on that. The other piece of that is is that when you not only the vehicles, but when you have these vehicle to infrastructure, or that next step, when you have stationary systems outside of the vehicle where you need to put, provide power and energy systems in all types of different environment. Um, not only the charging of these systems because they could be a, in very isolated places, um, but also the, in the uh, temperature environment that these things might uh, be operating in. You've got to have battery solutions that can handle those things. Some of the main challenges is that um, with other vehicles out there, for example, vehicles that don't or will not become pre-equipped with uh, DSRC is how do we make these particular standards or these devices standardize um, and how do we make them interoperable? Right now it's kind of, you know, still in a development phase and a research phase. So we're working on interoperability across device manufacturers, configuration parameters, for example, as well, and overall certification of the equipment and installation process for new and old vehicles that are coming around. So that's, we find that the largest challenge because from a technical standpoint, everything seems to be running pretty well. Memory protection devices, providing battery holders for all your board level applications since 1980. Visit batteryholders.com today for more information. So Matt, you mentioned that Tektronics is a test company. What test solutions are there for potential interference between WLAN devices and the surrounding environment of the car? Uh, we, Tektronix offers a line of real-time spectrum analyzers that have a way to see the live RF spectrum as the devices are communicating with each other. And that's important because you want to be able to see infrequently occurring events to make sure that a glitch doesn't occur, for example, that could be coming from software or could be coming from some unexpected interaction within the system, like with the power supply uh, not maintaining the correct voltage, for example. Um, so having the ability to discover signals is important. And then also, once things are discovered, we have mixed domain oscilloscopes that have the unique ability to be able to look at the RF spectrum at the same time as looking at, at the control buses, at the serial data buses that supply those devices. So to make sure there's not some sort of unexpected or unfavorable interaction between those systems. And then Murata is big on um, their module solution. You take pride in what you guys create for your customers. What are the wireless module solutions available that can that can guarantee successful B2B communication between two cars? So there are, there are different solutions. Uh, there are uh, companies, uh, uh, customers, who just want 11P to enable as a safety feature in the car. So we are enabling a complete module solution with 11P feature only. But at the same time, our customers are asking, they want a traditional Wi-Fi 11 and 11 AC with 11 P. So you can have uh, infotainment, uh, uh, streaming of video inside the car. At the same time, the same module can be used to talk to other cars. So we are enabling both solutions uh, and uh, just to make it easy for our customer to create a variety of products. Uh, also, our goal is to enable aftermarket products, which can come into the market sooner because uh, the new products that are being designed in for new models, you know, they are further out. And these aftermarket products coming in sooner can help to, to get introduce the technology sooner into the market. Edgardo, I know that you um, spoke about multi-layer organic technology. Um, how does that specific technology relate to the growing automotive market, especially when it's affiliated with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication? With the multi-layer organic technology, we're able to build uh, really good RF components, um, RF microwave components, which are going to be used in the um, automotive vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communications applications. And with that, we can build our very complex filters and uh, different types of devices that are going to be used and, uh, with specific to diplexer, which is like a two-filter type of device. Um, uh, <clears throat> we're able to make uh, components that are that are reliable enough for, for the automotive applications because they expand and contract with the printer circuit board because they're made of similar materials to printer circuit board. And as you know, in, as you know, you go from winter to summer in a car, um, temperature change, oh, varies widely. That's gonna make the circuit board expand and contract um, as the temperature changes and 
our, our components are able to, to match the circuit board's um, changes so that there's more reliability and less issues with respect to uh, 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 terminations, cracking, or that type of thing. Uh, the noise was practically with that. And also still maintain high performance when it comes to RF uh, performance. And then Eric, what sort of um, power solutions do you feel are needed to help guarantee successful V2V and V2I, meaning vehicle to infrastructure sure. um, communication? Yeah, so I, I think it's, you, you can really separate those into two separate areas. If I'm looking at V2V, uh, you know, vehicle to vehicle communications, um, what, what you're looking for is, as I mentioned before, is you're going to get a lot of the power and energy from the vehicle when it's operating itself. Uh, yet, if, the, if there's something with the vehicle power, say it's stranded on the road at some place and you need some sort of battery backup system, what you're going to want is you're going to want a system that can provide the amount of energy uh, into maybe passing vehicles that go by that can communicate that way uh, in that kind of environment, something that's relatively self-contained. It's something that's got to work in a variety of temperature ranges down from say minus 40 to plus 85 C, and there's a variety of different chemistries uh, that can do that. You know, one of the things that's nice about VARTA is that we're a very chemistry agnostic standpoint, is we look at a variety of chemistry systems, and we try to design solutions that are going to be a very good fit for the specific application. If I move to, to V to I, or vehicle to infrastructure, and I look at that infrastructure piece, what you want to do is you want to have a system that not only can look at those wide temperature ranges that you have, but also be able to take energy, say, from, a, from the solar to basically recharge these systems. Because obviously you want these systems to be able to work 24-7. And also have a very good reliability. You want these things to last a very long time, more than 15, you know, maybe 20 years. Because what's happening is, is that you don't want to have a technician having to go out there and replace battery systems, you know, on a consistent basis. Because that, from an economic standpoint, it would just ruin, you know, put it, you know why you're going to put the technology in in the first place. SciTech Corporation manufactures over 300 types of innovative modular switching products that can be assembled and configured to provide an almost infinite variety of systems. We can design a custom solution for any switching project. With 30 years experience in the industry, flexible configurations, a five-year warranty, exhaustive product testing, and competitive pricing, you can't go wrong with SciTech. Obvious from our discussion right now, you can tell that there's a lot of components that are going to be involved with, within this specific concept. What specific um, protocols and standards, specifications do we need to be concerned about when it comes to this type of technology? I think it has been mentioned already, 802.11p is kind of the most likely standard that's going to be used. But I think just in terms of infotainment, there could be other links. Bluetooth is operating in the same environment, maybe not necessarily the same frequencies. And then also the other 802.11 wireless LAN, Wi-Fi types of protocols might be used as well. 802, up to 802.11 AC is the most recent protocol. Um, and that we have you know, some test solutions for all of those, but those are some of the examples, maybe even some of the cellular signals as well. I think in addition to that, the 802.11p, but also GPS. So integrating GPS into that same uh, RF module that, that the V2I, uh, V2V uh, um, modules are going to be uh, put into. So you're going to require GPS and also Wi-Fi, which is your 802.11p um, frequency range. And also, from a passive components point of view, a, um, ACG200 qualification, which is a reliability type of qualification that automotive uh, customers require. You know, it's, it's smart to do so. That's, that's why you're cars operate so well and you don't get too much uh, no problem. And on top of uh, 11P, which is an air interface, SAE has defined a protocol, the DSRC slash WAVE protocol that defines layer one through four. So that's specific, now you're adding more details of how the communication will take place. And then where the things gets left off is for OEM to decide how to actually inform so you have a data coming from sensor that you are heading into a crash. Well, how do you actually show that? Or do, do you sound an alarm or, or do, you, um, do, do you create a, a, some sort of a flag on your dashboard or something? Or do you automatically uh, apply brakes? Uh, so those are the other challenges that OEM has to face on top of what the standards are doing. And actually, just to build on that, I mean, these guys are talking a lot about the electronics that go into that, right? And so from my standpoint, I can't really talk to that. But what I can talk to is more about the supply chain standpoint when you're putting a power solution in some of these things. 
Uh, as, I, as you begin to take a look at it, there's a lot of regulations uh, for batteries that you need to follow in order to transport the battery. So if I'm, a, uh, if I'm an OEM and I'm installing a, a, uh, a product with a battery inside of it, I have to understand if I'm using a lithium system, you know, the, the certain UN uh, transportation regulations that are associated with that. Uh, that could, you know, determining on how big the battery is and how, uh, how much uh, energy that, that's in that and where that needs to go would, uh, you know, I might have different transportation regulations from that, you know, from, a, uh, from the standpoint. Um, you know, the recycling of, of batteries, you know, during the whole product life cycle, how can you get product, maybe it's out in the field or in the vehicle, how can that get that exchange? And understanding, you know, certain battery chem chemistries lend themselves to be better uh, adapted to that uh, versus others. So the main one is uh, SAE J2735, uh, the basic safety message. Uh, like I stated before, a lot of stuff that we do is based off of safety. So information out of there is what we primarily work off of. And right now it's in a, in a pretty good state, but they're making some updates to it, as well as other standards that are coming out in the near future that haven't been really uh, fully developed just yet, but there are coming around the horizon. Components Corporation is the global leader in the design, manufacturer, and engineering of precision printed circuit test points, interconnect and testing devices, printed circuit card edge connectors, preformed jumpers, hardware, and battery contacts. Visit us at www.componentscorp.com. One of my final questions is, I mean, this is something that obviously has to have a lot of thought go into it, and there's a lot of components and different technologies to make it successful. So in your guys' opinion, what are some of the major catalysts that we need to get this up and running on a mass market and mass integrated? What, what do you think needs to happen? Because, I mean, there's going to be some cars that don't have this technology, and the cars that do have this technology, they're not going to be able to communicate with them, and that's going to cause a problem. So what are some of the things that need to be done? I think from a test perspective, you know, we have to have solutions that are easy to use, that are well integrated, so it doesn't present a huge barrier for people to actually implement the technology. So it has to not be a complete science experiment or exploration, something that's easy to use and effective at troubleshooting issues as they arise to get products out to market as quickly as possible. I think, uh, like Eric mentioned, we see it vehicle to vehicle as a short term and vehicle to infrastructure as a long term. And within vehicle to vehicle, um, you can have aftermarket products come in fairly quickly, just like uh, early days, you know, GPS, PND guys were introduced GPS and eventually it started in luxury cars and mid-end cars. Um, so we see that uh, potential introduction uh, could occur much sooner, you know, maybe 2015, 2016. Uh, but in terms of catalyst, uh, what's really needed is, you know, a, a true government mandate to say, this is the launch where X number of vehicles, new models must support this feature. You know, uh, I think that's the, that would be a true catalyst to have a mass market uh, uh, adoption. Yeah, uh, just just to kind of build on that is, is that uh, you see that some of that already happening in Europe, where uh, some of the e-call systems are being mandated over in Europe, and that and that's what's happening. That essentially is a catalyst for moving those sort, some of these these things forward. Um, when you begin to take a look at the V to V and what it enables, or the V to I and what that enables, what are some of the you know the question that you have to ask is what are some of those industries that benefit from that? So, for example. Does an insurance industry benefit from that? You know, having that, you know, to, to reduce the amount of uh, premiums on insurance, uh, to reduce the amount of claims that happen, to you know, from a protection standpoint. If I told you that, look, if putting this system, at, whether it's a you know integrated system or an aftermarket system, putting us something like this can reduce your insurance premium by 20 percent, there could be some incentive for putting a device like this in there because, from the overall component standpoint, it probably wouldn't. You would probably make up for that in a year's time frame. And that might be a catalyst enough to move those things forward. So basically, uh, some of the things I've heard um, is that there may be, just like when hybrids and um, electric vehicles are coming out, you get some sort of benefit, a tax benefit or HOV uh, privilege. There could be implementations such as that that could help out, you know, to the mass market of things, at least make it penetrate uh, faster. And obviously, the, the DOT or Department of Transportation um, stating that all vehicles must have this uh, moving forward as well too as one of those large catalysts moving forward. Well, I agree with uh, um, that uh, That as, as more automotive manufacturers begin to uh, adopt 
the B2B and B2I, I mean, it'll, it'll become more common out there. And also the aftermarket uh, uh, manufacturers. I mean, it seems like the Google car is really pushing it. Yeah. I mean, with all the stuff that they're doing. Um, Virginia Tech, even so, I mean, they're, they're pushing a lot of new ideas out there as well. Yeah, it's like the next level right. type of stuff up there. Yeah. Right. Well, is there anything else um, you would like to add to the conversation that you think is important for our viewers to know, especially within the industries that you're involved in? I mean, I, th I think general general statement is, you know, there are 1.2 million people die from car crash, yeah. and then 50% of the car crash are right around the intersection. And uh, the, the number of injuries uh, from car crashes in millions, uh, the actual death is 1.2. So uh, there's a fundamental problem uh, it's built on, which is safety. But on top of safety, once you take that data and connect to infrastructure, now you can do bring efficiency in traffic. And, and one of the global trend is mega cities. Mm -hmm. And this helps. So the you have vehicle vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure happening on one side. You have autonomous car activity happening on the side. But they can converge uh, and they kind of go hand in hand together. So uh, and it, it participates in the global trend that's going to that's occurring and global problems and traffic jams and uh, safety. So I think it's the uh, all the ingredients are in place for this technology to to launch and to come into the market and, and uh, come to fruition. Just like airbags is a mandate, you know, we fully expect that vehicle to vehicle communication will be a mandate at some point. I think for the I guess. The, like building on this topic, the next level type of stuff would be uh, uh, better connectivity within the car itself. So maybe the next, you know, talks about Ethernet in the car uh, to improve connectivity between the different modules in the car to better control the car, whether, you know, how soon it breaks and, and you know, all those. Um, overall, I think uh, what you can hear from Virginia Tech Transportation Institute is that we're going to obviously continue growing and seeing this in a Northern Virginia test bed as well, we're going to have a larger deployment out here, at least we plan to, um, to basically assess these overall technologies. Um, it's going to be open public test bed, um, so if other device manufacturers are out there and wanted to test their particular equipment in an environment, a real world environment, uh, we will have something up and running in the near future that uh, we can help assist and also assess based off of um, the type of technology you guys plan on implementing. I, I just, again, from the from the power and energy standpoint, it's, uh, the vehicle vehicle is very straightforward. Uh, you know, you look at it from a backup system and, you know, if, if you're using a battery, um, it's, there are some very uh, common solutions out there today that would be able to power these modules. Um, the infrastructure is a little bit more difficult uh, because there's a lot of technology that's coming in there. I think the, you know, the one thing that you know, I, I would want uh, to kind of tell OEMs is to kind of uh, look, at, look at things from a black box solution, okay? And look at it and say, this is what I want my power and energy solution to be able to do, to be able to handle and then allow people like us that deal with this on a daily basis to come up to you with the best solution. Really be that kind of consultative approach uh, you know, for you because at, at the end of the day, that's gonna be the best solution uh, and it, you're, it's gonna enable you to be the most successful in your market. It will be interesting to see how this technology progresses in the upcoming years. For wireless design and development, I'm Megan Zimba. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.